the more information that you can provide to a consumer, whether it's a physical product or an experience, is going to increase your odds of uh, conversion. Welcome to the Agents of Change, the podcast experience you've been waiting for your entire marketing career. Search, social, mobile, AI, blockchain, and neuromarketing. These are the Agents of Change, and so are you. Digital marketing success awaits, and your transformation begins now. Welcome to another episode of the Agents of Change podcast, the podcast that's here to help you reach and engage more of your ideal customers online and to generate more leads, sales, and revenues from your website. My name is Rich Brooks. I'm your host. This is episode 559, powered by Flight New Media. If you're running an e-commerce site, chances are you're investing money in advertising. Google ads, Facebook ads, sponsorships, and so on, all to generate more revenue at your website. Well, before you spend another dime, it might be time to reevaluate your product detail pages, your PDPs, and whether they're helping you close the sale. After all, what's the point of spending money on traffic if your e-commerce store can't convert it? But don't worry, because today we'll be diving deep into PDPs, product detail pages, and giving you a recipe for success. Before the episode is even over, you'll know exactly how to rewrite your page and add critical elements to increase conversions and boost revenue. In fact, let's not wait. Let's get right to it. As the chief marketing officer at One World Sync, a leading SaaS platform for product content orchestration, my next guest leads a global team of marketers and sales development professionals who help brands and retailers sell more confidently with impactful content. With over 20 years of experience in B2B marketing, sales, and customer service, he has a proven track record of launching and growing successful divisions, products, and solutions in the e-commerce hosting and IT infrastructure domains. Today, we're going to be looking at how to improve your e-commerce results with TJ Waldorf. TJ, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, uh, before we kind of jump into e-commerce, just tell me a little bit about One World Sync and the type of work that you do for your clients. Sure. Yeah. So you said, you know, One World Sync, we're a leader in product content orchestration. I know that's a little bit of a mouthful, but essentially what that means is there's a lot of data and there's a lot of content as it relates to products that are sold, whether it's in store. So you go into a grocery store or, you know, an other physical retail store or online. And there's a lot of teams involved, a lot of different, you know, types of content and types of data. And our view on that is we're helping our customers, which are brands, retailers, distributors, wholesalers, so on and so forth, really orchestrate that or bring harmony to everything that's involved in order to sell more, right? Like that's that's really the the, the end result and the end goal. Awesome. Because yes, when it comes to e-commerce, that is the end goal is to yeah. sell more. So let's talk a little bit about product detail pages, PDPs, yep. what are some of the key elements that can make or break a sale? Yeah. So as you said, PDP is a product detail page. And effectively what that is, if you go to, you know, let's say you're on Amazon or you're on Walmart, you're looking for a specific product or a category of product, you know, you're going to type that into search and you're going to get some results. And then you're going to click on the one that you think that you want to buy. When you get to that page, that's the PDP. That's the product detail page. That's going to tell you, a whole lot about that specific product. And that's everything from, you know, you're going to see photography, you know, images of the product. You're going to see the product description. You're going to see if it's a food product, you're going to see nutritional information. And then as you scroll down that page, you're going to see videos of somebody using the product or lifestyle shots, you know, more rich content that's going to help you make an informed decision. And then all the way down towards the end of the page, which, you know, lots of folks jump to right away, ratings and reviews, right? So you want to know what are other people saying about this thing that you might want to buy? And so before you click buy or put it in your uh, your cart, you understand more enough about the product to make an informed decision. So as we're talking through this, I mean, this often when I think of e-commerce pages or product pages, I'm literally thinking of a, a physical product that I would buy, would be shipped from Amazon or some small, medium-sized e-commerce 
company who's going to sell me this product. But I've also I'm also thinking about things like trips, and I, I we've worked with small businesses that do trips in Europe. So are there differences in your experience between selling a physical product on an e-commerce page and maybe selling a an experience? We operate more so in the physical product space. That being said, I think a lot of it's still true for experiences or other non kind of physical products that you're either going to go into the store and pick up or it's going to be shipped to your house because you still want to know, you know, if you're going to take a trip, you want to know what things look like at the resort that you're about to go to. You want to know reviews from other people that have taken that trip, good or bad, whatever that mix is. So you're still going to want as much information as you can, especially for expensive purchases, right? And trips tend to be pretty pricey. So the more information that you can provide to a consumer, whether it's a physical product or an experience, is going to increase your odds of conversion. You checked off a lot of things that we can add to our PDPs. And I know that One World Sync does a lot of consumer research. From that research, what are the factors that you feel influence a consumer's buying decision the most? Yeah, so there's we actually just released our it's our fourth annual consumer product content benchmark report. So we go out and read, we survey this year was 7,750 uh, consumers across North America and just help us understand like what are the changes in habits when you're shopping online as it relates to product content. And one of the stats from, from this year was that, and this is up about 10 points from last year, is that 78% of consumers are going to decide not to buy a product because of either poor quality content or a lack of content, right? And that could be not enough images, poor images that just don't really describe the product. And it can also include user-generated content, ratings and reviews, just seeing how other people are using it. There's just not enough or it's just not good. And that is... That need has been consistent, but we've seen it grow over the over the four years, as you probably expect, as more consumers are shopping online. Makes sense. How important is rich content like images, like video in the e-commerce space? And what are the things that small to medium-sized businesses should prioritize in those kind of rich content areas? Yeah, so rich content, and sometimes it's, depending on the retailer, it's called below the fold content. Amazon calls it A-plus content. It can be called a number of different things, but that's, if you get about halfway down the product detail page, that's the content where it could be videos. It could be things like in the consumer electronics space, you see something called hotspots where on a certain part of the product, you can click one of these hotspots and it'll expand and just show you more information. All of that's becoming just incredibly important. Again, especially for high value products or products that are going to cost a lot, but we're seeing it more and more in consumer packaged goods, even in grocery too, because you can tell the brand's story. Like that piece of the PDP is where the brand basically has full control over what they want to show and what they want to say, right? And so one of the, we had a couple of customers, but Simple Mills, they're a Chicago-based company, fantastic customer. And they just have a, a really rich brand story. And that part of the PDP is, is where they tell the story of the founder and just how they're doing sourcing of their their products and the ingredients and all of that. And so it's it's growing in importance and we think it's obviously very important. When you say it's a place for brands to tell their story and maybe yeah. this, was it Simple Mills? Is that the name of the brand? Yeah. Yep. So are they able to tell their story just on their website or is this also an opportunity like if they were on Amazon or some other type of marketplace, is that also an opportunity to be able to tell your brand story there too? Yeah, that's actually what I was referring to is on. So they obviously have their own direct to consumer site where they're going to be able to do a lot of that clearly. But if they're selling in Walmart or they're selling in someplace like Kroger or on Amazon, there's that section of the PDP that's basically from the manufacturer, from the brand where they can take a lot of that really great content that they might have on their direct to consumer site and bring that over onto the retail e com experience as well. And the neat thing is you can do that. You can do that in our platform by pushing a button and publishing out to whatever retailers that you're selling with. So it just creates a nice kind of consistent experience for the consumers that are considering your product. Tell me a little bit about your platform. So you guys, besides being kind of consultants, you've got your own platform that you also have clients on? Yeah, we're, we're a SaaS provider, right? So we're the majority of our business, we're a software 
as a service company. So, you know, the brand, we essentially sit between a brand and a retailer, kind of the platform sits between the two. So if you're a brand, let's say richest cookies or richest protein bars or whatever it's going to be, and you're either creating your own content or maybe you're working with an agency, or in some cases, oftentimes brands will work with us where we take product photography. We've got a studio in Chicago. So you're creating that content and then that content goes into our platform. And that's really where you manage everything and manage kind of the the operations and the workflow of which retailers do I need to syndicate and publish this to, if there's changes to certain information, ingredients, package sizes, whatever that might be, all that's done within our software. And then that, again, connects out to a broad network of retailers. Awesome. So I have a background in SEO. I'm always fascinated by SEO considerations, especially when it comes to e-commerce. How do you work with SEO needs when it comes to these PDPs? Yeah, great question. So we we do have some services where we can help you know, you know our brands um, with their SEO needs. So in those cases, we're helping them and we're kind of guiding them based on analytics that we have and saying, hey, here's some search terms that we're seeing pop up in your category that maybe you're not using or considering yet. You probably should. In other cases, the brand might be working with an outside agency or internal teams to develop that content. And then that, again, that content goes into our platform and then gets pushed out to the retailers' e com sites. All right. And so you mentioned before a uh, place that we always look, and then God knows I always look at the review section as well. Yeah. What are some tips that you have for e commerce site owners when it comes to reviews, either how to get more reviews or maybe yeah. how to manage reviews or anything like that? So get a lot of them. That would be the first one. Now, all, all joking aside, depending on the retailer that you're selling on, they've got different requirements. So some retailers might say, hey, you need to have at least 10 reviews on your on this product or on this PDP in order to meet certain score for our e-com site, right? And if you don't meet that score, then there might be some, in some cases, there, there could be fines in order for that brand to get that up. When we see a brand that maybe is lacking reviews, one of the things that we can do and that we that we offer is something called sampling. And so in cases where you need more reviews or maybe you're launching a new product and you want that product to already have reviews the day that it shows up on Amazon or shows up on Walmart. We have a sampling program where our brands will say, we want to send out a hundred, a thousand samples of our products to this community of folks that are willing to do that. And if they sample it, then um, they'll go and leave a review. And it's, it's marked that they had sampled the product. So that's transparent, but that is a way to get, to get more reviews. Awesome. The The other thing I'd say too, is there's a bit of a misconception that negative reviews are the worst thing possible. And that's that's actually not the case because consumers, the way that they think through these things, that if you see a product that has nothing but five-star reviews, that creates a little bit of hesitancy and a little bit of suspicion that where do these come from? Is this, is this actually legit? And so in some cases, negative reviews in the mix, obviously you don't want products that are just all negative reviews can actually be helpful to consumer decisions. Is there any opportunity to ask customers to review certain aspects of the product or is it something that's more of just it's all blind and basically if people choose to leave a review they leave a review and they're going to review it the way they want and focus on the elements that they're most interested in no there is so you know we think of so ratings and reviews are within this bigger umbrella of user-generated content and so if a brand wants maybe reviews or even pictures or videos of a consumer using a product in a certain way, like they can run programs like that and we can help Mm -hmm. them do that. But again, you want to be transparent and it's not, you know, something that is, it's not going to be believable. Right. But if you want, Hey, how's the product being used on the beach or how's the product being used in certain scenarios, then that's something that you can, can kind of guide. All right. Now, if somebody's listening, they've got an e-commerce site, many small businesses have very limited resources. If you had to prioritize like the top two or three things that somebody should tackle if they don't think their pages are performing as well as they could be, Mm -hmm. what are those two or three things that you would start with? You know, the product description has to be very high on the list and it is high on the list if you look at our our, our research, because if you're not getting found when somebody's searching for it, then they're not going to have a chance to, to see the rest of the stuff, right? So product descriptions... The image carousel is very important because that's going to be one of the first things that a consumer sees. And you can 
if you think many, many years ago, that image carousel might have had, and still in some cases it does, one or two very basic images of a product. But now you see image carousels that are many images, lifestyle shots, sometimes videos, ingredients, things of that, that nature. So that's another important one. And then ratings and reviews. It really is. It's super important. And where we see especially smaller brands doing a good job is on their direct-to-consumer website because they're they're doing a lot of that collection and, and work themselves, but maybe not as well on other retail e-com sites that they sell through, other channels that they sell through. So there's something called syndication where they can take those reviews that they're capturing on their site, on their D2C site, mm. and syndicate that out to other other to other channels. So that's something that would be very high on the list as well. Absolutely. So we really, you, you really identify two different types of sales. One is that direct to consumer that's straight from our own website. Others were kind of syndicating our content to third party retailers. If we're playing in that third party retailer space, mm-hmm. how important is the name of the product? Because I know when I go to a, a site like Home Depot or Amazon to buy something, sometimes the names of these products feel like it's more about the keywords, the actual branding of the product. So mm-hmm. do you have any advice? Like, should we? not worry about that? Or should we be cramming as many keywords into the title tag as possible when it comes to syndicating our products to other sites? It is important to worry about it. It needs to be intuitive so that when consumers are searching, even if it's around a category that they're gonna, that you're going to get found. So it is important. Absolutely. And, and the other thing I'd say is that you, if you're just doing keyword stuffing, depending on the different, re- each retailer is going to have their own kind of algorithm on how stuff shows up keyword stuffing, as you well know, right? In the old Google days, that was a thing that re- worked really well. Doesn't work anymore. It's similar on retail sites. All right. Yeah. Because I've definitely done searches for like earbuds and the number of descriptive words for those earbuds in the title tag is like longer than the actual content description. So yeah. they may have gone overboard. We spent a lot of time talking about these PDPs, but how about the category pages? If we are on the direct consumer size, mm-hmm. what considerations or recommendations do you have on the shoe page that then leads to all the different shoes on our site? On a direct consumer site or on a, a on the direct to consumer site? where we have some control. Yeah. I mean, I think that you have to, you know, you have to think through how a consumer is going to navigate that. Right. So that, that category page needs to be very clear on, you know, what they're looking for, obviously, but where do you want them to go next? And that next thing is going to be that PDP. And so making that, that process and that experience as seamless as possible so that when they hit the category page, they click on the, you know, the product that they think they want to buy, once they hit the actual PDP, it doesn't feel disjointed from the category page. And so I think that's something that needs to be taken into to, to extreme consideration. Now, I'm guessing that you spend some time and certainly the site owner spent some time taking a look at whether pages are performing well or not. Yeah. I'm sure that obviously one of the main concerns is, is it selling enough? Is there a positive ROI on this page? Are there any other KPIs or criteria that you're looking at to determine whether or not a page is as effective as it can be? Yeah, conversions, obviously, as you said, a, a super important one. If it's not, you're not getting somebody to buy the product and you're not doing your uh, your full job. You know, the other thing that we look at is, you know, we've got tools to help our brands understand pricing differences across different retailers, but also within the same retailer. So to use an example, you know, Walmart's a good example where you think of Walmart as one retailer, but within the United States, there's 4,500 plus different Walmart locations. And so when you're thinking of that e-commerce experience, it might seem like you've got one walmart.com, but you really have 4,500 walmart.coms because there's different store locations where you can go buy products, right? So if I'm in... If I'm in, uh, I live in Naperville, Illinois, if I want to go and buy a product at my local Walmart in Naperville, and I search for that product, find it, look at the price, that price may be different at the one in Schaumburg or in uh, Glen Ellen, what have you, right? So as a brand, you want to understand that because if there's big pricing discrepancies, you could be missing out on sales. And so there's tools that, you know, that we offer and there's others out there that you can understand that you know, if I'm selling a protein bar in the Naperville location for three bucks, but it's priced at eight dollars in Glen Ellen, well, I'm probably not selling a whole lot of those protein bars at that location. So that's when the brand would reach out to their, you know, their merchant at that store and say, "Hey, might have been miskeyed. Something's off here. Let's get that corrected." 
That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it in that way, but I do see when I go to like Home Depot, it's like, oh, I need to get a generator. Well, there's no generators at your store, but here's one 60 miles away if you want to go. So I hadn't thought about the pricing piece. So that's interesting. I've read that Amazon is using AI to constantly write and rewrite PDPs on their own website. Is this something that direct consumer brands should be considering as well? And if so, what impact has AI had in your little neck of the woods? Yeah, so we, so I do think that there's an application and there's going to be growing applications for AI and how you're using AI to, whether it's dynamically update product content based on where consumers are clicking and they're, you know, spending more time on this part of the page. So maybe there's content there that we should use over here. So I do think that there's that application. You know, some of the things that we've also seen is just using AI to draft product descriptions or product copy, things of that nature. Image generations, another one. You still see the 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 weird ones with people with six fingers, seven fingers, that kind of stuff. So you got to be careful with it. But the application of AI, whether it's in D 2 C or retail e-commerce sites, you know, it's an important one for for all brands to, to keep an eye on. If we have both an online presence, an e-commerce store, and we have a retail space, mm-hmm. are there any recommendations you have for creating more of a seamless experience between the two? Selfishly, yes. <laughs> use use a single platform to manage that content. I mean, really, really, you 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 need to understand all the different sources of content. What I mean by that is that you have in some cases, an agency might be creating something for you. You might be creating something in-house. And depending on where you're using it and where that consumer is looking, and we know consumers in our research are looking at four to six different websites. So it could be your direct consumer. They go to three different e-com sites to understand more about the product and where they want to buy it. Pricing is a consideration that to create that seamless experience, you do want to have your content kind of show up in those places in a consistent way, right? Mm, um, yeah. So that's that's kind of a fundamental thing that we think a lot about and that we're always having conversations with our customers about. Because if you don't get that piece right, it's hard to get the rest of it right. I find myself buying a lot more products on my phone these days, yeah. as I'm sure most consumers do. Any tips for making sure that our PDPs are as mobile friendly as possible? So I, you know, not as much from a web dev standpoint, but I'll t- maybe I'll talk about, I'll take this a little bit different direction. One of the things that we're seeing, and again, it shows up in our research, is the use of what are called 2D barcodes or QR codes being used more and more while, you know, I got my cell phone, while you're in the store and you've got a physical product that you picked up, scanning that that QR code to see things like rating, ratings and reviews or just more information about the product. So whether you're going to the DTC site or it's, or it's a retail site, the mobile friendliness of that is clearly important because if you've got something that's not mobile friendly and you've got to scroll a bunch of different ways and do all that, it's going to be goofy. But just the use of QR codes and that mobile experience, even while consumers are in the store physically walking around is has been awesome to see just working in this space, but a really important, really important consideration for brands now. And as we think, there's something called the 2D barcode Sunrise that's happening in 2027, where everybody's going to have to have a 2D barcode on their packages. All right. We'll be looking forward to that. TJ, this has been very helpful. If people want to learn more about you, if they want to learn more about One World Sync, where can we send them? Yeah. So first thing I just say, go to oneworldsync.com right on our homepage. If you want to get access to that, uh, that research that we just published, that's there. I'm on LinkedIn. So connect with me on LinkedIn. If anybody has any questions, happy to to answer them and and take the conversation further. Awesome. And we'll have those links in the show notes as always. TJ, thank you so much for showing up today. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. For a full transcript of today's episode, along with the show notes and the links that TJ shared with us, a quick recap and everything else you need to make this work for you, head on over to our website at theagentsofchange.com slash 559. And if you have a friend who's struggling with e-commerce and trying to generate more sales on their website, do us all a favor, send them a link to this week's episode and let them know that you care. 
We've got some great guests and some amazing topics coming your way. So if you're not subscribed yet, head on over to your favorite podcasting platform and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And if you have an e-commerce site and you're looking to improve conversions, don't just sit back and, and think about this episode. Go take action. Make those changes that TJ shared with us and start seeing your website generate more business for you. Don't sit on the sidelines. Instead, become an agent of change. Don't miss another thrilling episode of the Agents of Change podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform.